Let's, okay. Let's do that. Okay. Thank you. No problem. I think we're going. Okay. Should I go ahead and jump in, Anna, or do you want to introduce the topic? Or I do. So welcome everybody to another weekly series of Food Revolution from Farm to School. And we're really excited this week to talk with Laura Edwards Orr from the Center for Good Foods, the Center for Good Food Purchasing. It's a really, really great organization I learned about a few years ago. And they have been working with um, several of our school districts in the Ventura County School Farm, Farm to School Collaborative. And um, they do really great work. And she's gonna tell us more about what they do. And um, I think we should get started. That's great. Thank you, Anna. And that, that introduces me just well enough. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk with you all this afternoon. It's really exciting to be able to talk to some students and some of the other professionals that are, are helping um, make good food happen at your school at Oxnard Union um, and to share a little bit about our program and what it looks like and how you can be engaged with it even more. So thank you for having me and making space for the conversation. So to get started, um, just at the highest level to start with who we are at the Center for Good Food Purchasing. So this is this is our mission statement. We use the power of procurement to create a transparent and equitable food system that prioritizes the health and well-being of people, animals, and the environment. Um, and I highlighted a handful of key words that, that feel important to call out in that mission statement. So procurement, uh, technically speaking, the process of buying goods and services. Um, but that's it's a formal process when public dollars, tax dollars are used to buy goods and services. It's not the same as going to a store and picking out what you want to buy. There's a formal process that we go through. And at the Center for Good Food Purchasing, we see that investment in process and public dollars uh, as a real opportunity to make sure that the dollars in your community are being used in a way that reflects the values of your community. Um, so that, that's the power of procurement and how we think about it. And then transparency, um, you know, using our program and collaboration with school districts like yours to make sure that everybody knows where their food comes from and how it was grown and how it was raised so that we can be having a conversation together about the food system that's based in um, the very real information uh, that sits behind the food that shows up on your plate. And then equitable, really important to talk about uh, making sure that our food system is not only providing access, but bringing food to people and communities that's culturally appropriate and relevant, and that food um, communities have food sovereignty, uh, you know, the ability to make decisions that are appropriate for themselves and their families about the food that they're eating. So those are some really high level values that sit inside this mission statement. And then, um, so you see again here, healthy, equitable, and regenerative, those reflect some of those core values that we were just talking about, but our program then drops down to at the operational level, we're focused on five particular values that show up in the food system, focused on measuring and educating around these values. So those are local economies, valued workforce, animal welfare, environmental sustainability, and nutrition. Um, so I thought here just to you know get a little, little conversation going, um, I'd be really interested in hearing from folks around the table tonight I'm on the East Coast, so it's, it's nighttime here. Um, you know, what's important about each of these five concepts, these five values, when you think about our food system? So, you know, what comes to mind in terms of importance and impact when I say local economies and you're thinking about purchasing or valued workforce? And so I'd encourage anyone who's, who's feeling brave and conversational to pop off mute and just shout out, we can free associate a little bit about what you think about when you see these five values laid out this way. I mean, I think of quality, like 
it, the closer it's grown to home. And then also if we're using regenerative practices, we're going to get a better quality product nutritionally and flavor wise. Mm -hmm. What I love a few years ago, um, an economics teacher, a high school economics teacher told me, oh, I want you to talk about farm to school and how your program can actually, because, you know, he's teaching students that consumers are voting with their dollars and we're in a way shaping and changing our food system where we put our, where we put our money basically. So like when I was a kid growing up, you didn't really see organic food in a grocery store in the 80s and 90s. It just was not a thing. I didn't even probably know what it was, but now because our consumer base is demanding that, more people, more farms and producers are supplying that. And so um, it's just this great economics lesson of supply and demand. But um, what I love about your program is that um, you're taking into account how we can reach each of these values with our dollar. Um, and it's like our, it is, it's our power as, as people on a grassroots level is how we spend our money. And um, I think they're all really important concepts. I mean, I think because we work in Oxnard, I really, the one, the workforce, the labor issues really speak to me kind of because, um, and a lot of our students will say that their family are farm workers and we, you know, drive past them every day on our way to school. Um, and so really it's something that in the farm to school program, we definitely value is supporting farms that treat their workers well. Um, so something that I think is really especially important. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Anyone else want to share what they're thinking about? Well, I think it's really important that um, you guys value all these things because they really tie into each other because once you start focusing more on like nutrition of the food you then can also work more towards environmental sustainability because you care about the quality of the foods you're eating and then when you care more about environmental sustainability you're going to care more about animal welfare and the the workforce and that kind of stuff which then also ties into the local economy so I think all these things are really important and they really you can't really have environmental sustainability and then have poor animal welfare or a poor you're not valuing your workforce so I think it's really important to tie all of these things together um, and create like a strong local economy um, and you know provide nutritious food awesome so well put Anything else coming to mind for folks? We had some, some nice, big, expansive answer to open the conversation. Great. Well, there's the, I'm hoping that there'll be plenty of time for conversation and we're a small enough group that I would you know, urge folks to just pop off mute and jump in with a question. If you have one, happy to stay in conversation as, as we move through the, the short presentation. Okay, so, so those are our five values. And when an institution like Oxnard Union enrolls in the program, we work in partnership with the school to collect an entire year's worth of purchasing data. Every single line item in those financial records, we're gathering those and looking, gathering as much information as we can about where those products were grown, uh, whether there was a union contract where the, on the farm or where the product was manufactured so that we can evaluate every single item that's purchased against um, the standards that we have for each of these five value categories and offer some insight for, for your school and for your community in terms of how those purchases are lining up with these values and how, how they're bringing to light all of those incredibly important and interrelated issues that, that you all just highlighted here. So that is the, the work of our team. And then my role, I get the pleasure of working with Anna and others after that assessment has been generated to help set goals and strategies in terms of deepening and increasing performance in the program over time. So that's a really exciting piece that I get to play and I always look forward to when we're working with institutions. So um, just a little bit in practice. So the Los Angeles Unified School District was the first school district, first institution to enroll in the Good Food Purchasing Program. And just to put a little bit more context on that conversation we just had about these value categories and how they can make a really real impact um, for communities 
near the districts um, that are buying these purchases. So Los Angeles is a very, very big school district, $125 million in spend, 600 plus students. 84% uh, of those students qualify for free and reduced lunch. So we're talking about a fairly diverse uh, student body from an economic perspective, and they're serving about 700,000 meals a day. So a very large operation. Um, and when they enrolled in the program and worked with the team at the center to focus on measuring and then increasing their purchasing of food that qualifies in each five each of these five value categories, we start to see some pretty remarkable change over time. So $12 million redirected to local farms and generating 200, uh, 220 jobs uh, in the local economies category, uh, transitioning 100% of their chicken products to race without routine antibiotics. We know that that has an uh, impact on the environment and a related impact on human health and well-being. Um, by transferring their purchasing over to unionized workers in the supply chain or supply chain players that had union uh, presence and organizing, we saw a 40% wage increase for 320 workers in the supply chain supporting LAUSD. And then in animal welfare, they were able to, over time, uh, see a 10% reduction in animal protein per meal served. So, we offer our institutions a handful of ways to address animal welfare. One is buying high welfare products, and the other is to reduce their animal product purchases if they're not able to identify high welfare products that um, are affordable, for example, or available at the scale that they need. This reduction strategy is another way of manifesting that value that might fit with an institution's operations. Um, and then in the nutrition category, this is a really exciting piece, and I was not with the center at the time, but uh, LAUSD and the Center for Good Food Purchasing partnered with local suppliers to uh, generate a new bread product for their menu that had low sodium and was made from local sustainable wheat. Um, so through that project, they were able to serve 45 million servings of that bread product. And that's actually a product that's expanded to other GFPP institutions over time as it gained in popularity. So this is the this is the kind of ways we are, um, you know, not only looking at what those purchasing dollars look like at the school, but how they impact the community and ripple out in terms of a regional food systems impact. So uh, Anna already covered some of this in her introduction, but we were really excited to have the opportunity to work with the Ventura Farm to School Collaborative that was able to secure a local food promotion program grant from the USDA to, among other things, increase their local purchasing and to use the Good Food Purchasing Program as an opportunity to track that over time. So we had six, six districts that completed a baseline assessment. That's what we call the first assessment an institution does where we can sort of measure a starting place to track progress over time. And in those assessments, we were looking at the 2018-2019 school year. Um, so overall that collaborative in those assessments that we looked at, that was more than $10 million in food spend. And Oxnard was actually a pretty significant portion of that with more than $4 million in food spend and 3.1, almost 3.2 uh, million meals served in the assessment that we looked at. And do you wanna add anything to this, just like big picture framing before I'm gonna jump into the Oxnard assessment results next? Um, yeah, this has been a really, so for, the, for anybody who doesn't know, our district participates in a group of um, districts in the county called the Ventura County Farm School Collaborative. And we um, applied for a USDA grant to pay for this assessment um, a couple of years ago. And so there's Ventura, Ojai, Oxnard Elementary, Rio School District, Wainimi, and Ocean View. And so it's been a really great project to be part of. And then um, something that's really exciting is one of the goals that came out of this assessment was a commitment to increase um, all of their district's local purchasing by 15%. Um, they don't have a how long it's going to take us to get there, but um, it's, it's just really exciting for us to actually like use this data and use the Center for Good Food Purchasing as a tool and give us a framework. And we're learning um, from all of these other case studies and all of these other examples from 
um, other districts that you guys have worked with. So it's been a really great, um, really great, exciting project. Yeah. Awesome. And a really great opportunity to look not only at what the purchasing power of a single institution looks like, but what it looks like when we get a group of institutions that have those shared values together to maximize their impact. So exciting for us as well to, to get to see what that can look like over time. So let's talk a little bit about what we saw in the data at Oxnard. Um, and you know, at the center, we, we like to talk about uh, how we celebrate the, all the great work that's already happening. Um, and there's a lot to celebrate in the Oxnard baseline assessment. Um, so again, we're measuring every single item against the qualifying indicators in all five value categories. So we saw 13.8, um, almost 14% of, of your spend going towards local economies, which is fantastic. It's very, very close to the, the baseline goal that we set of 15%. Um, so that 15% that the collaborative is looking to meet over time, you all are already very, very close to that. And in fact, one of the things that's the hardest for our team to secure when we're collecting data from vendors is production location. Um, so if you look at the assessment document itself, we have some metrics about how complete the data was. Were we able to get 100% of the information we need for every item? It takes us years of working with suppliers over time to get to 100%. So um, almost always as our data quality goes up and we get more information from the vendors that you're working with, this local economy's number tends to go up. And that's in part because folks like Anna and Elisa who are committed to this concept of buying local have been working on building that value in over time. So when we, we come in for a baseline assessment, particularly in local economies, it's often an opportunity to celebrate and recognize a lot of good work that's come before this, this measurement point. In environmental sustainability and animal welfare, you see that's where the numbers are the lowest, and that's very, very typical, particularly in school districts. Those products uh, tend to be hard to find in mainstream supply chains. So grocery stores are ahead of the curve, right? If they didn't have those organic products in the 80s and 90s, they have them now some of the institutional supply chains are a little bit slower to be responsive. And that's part of why this work is important. So we can send signals to those suppliers that these are products that we want. Um, they can often come at a bit of a price premium. And so it takes some time on the back end to think strategically about what items can we purchase at what volume that work for the farmers, that work for the suppliers, and also work for the very real constraints that public institutions are facing. Um, so here we see we've got some products that qualify for environmental sustainability and in the action planning process that the collaborative is going through, we look at strategies to increase um, purchasing of environmental sustainability. In Valley Workforce, however, and it's exciting to hear that that's a conversation that, that's live and, and an issue that's pretty close to home for folks in this community that makes sense why we see such a strong performance here in Valley Workforce. So, a leading indicator, 99% of the time we're looking at qualifying items for valued workforce, it's because there's a union contract either at the point of manufacturing or the point of production. There are third party certifications that we recognize, but by far and away, the presence of a union contract is the one that's the most common in the supply chains that we're looking at. So, and that would be a level three, the highest bar of an indicator for a valued workforce item. And so you see the qualifying threshold for a level three supply would be 5%. Y'all are at about 26%. So that's a really, really strong start out of the gate. And that's another number that we see uh, increase over time as we get more and more data in working with your suppliers on a regular basis. Um, animal welfare, so we touched on that, right? And this, this one, um, this is, it's a challenge, and that's also why we have those two pathways where we can, we can work together to identify item, high wildfire items that are going to qualify. Um, and we can also look at a reduction strategy, and the threshold there would be a 4% reduction of animal products per meal per year. Um, and so that's a partnership with our team to create the tools to sort of do, 
do the planning on the back end to figure out what that looks like to be reducing animal products over time from a menuing perspective, from a cost perspective, and finding items that um, that help replace those animal proteins with plant-based proteins. In the nutrition category, we look at a lot of stuff. It's really complicated on the back end because there are so many different factors. But simply put, it's a combination of looking at the item attributes, so looking at you know whole and minimally processed products, the percentage of fruits and vegetables relative to processed products uh, in the menu, uh, salt, sugar, whole grains, all of those factors that we know are indicators of a high quality product from a nutrition perspective. We're also looking at, um, at your operations. What, is, what does the food service operation look like and does it create a healthy eating environment for the students that are there? So we're looking at a number of different factors. Um, but again, um, Oxnard surpassed the, um, the baseline expectation of 51% of applicable items is the language with 65%. With so again, a really strong showing here. We have a we have a few questions. Mr. Hensley yeah. is one of our our favorite teachers, and he's joining us. Um, so, kind of, do you want to give us a rundown about what? Just an example. I know it's really complex, but like, for example, you know, what is an example of of meeting that goal towards animal welfare or um, the environmental sustainability? Like, what would that look like for yeah. us if we were to make? Okay, if you were to make those changes. Yeah. Yeah, and there's. There's no one size fits all, which is which is why you know there, there's not a standard answer. But um, so in environmental sustainability, there there are three factors to consider. One, we're looking for 25% of animal products to be raised without routine antibiotics, and that's actually a place where Oxnard um, was uh, fairly high performing. So you actually have a minimum of 25% animal products raised without routine antibiotics. So that's check one for environmental sustainability. The other is we're looking for no seafood items to be rated as a void by Monterey Bay Aquarium. And uh, that has not yet been met at Oxnard. There are a couple of seafood items uh, where we were not able to verify the fishing method or the source location to be able to determine whether those items would be rated as a void. And those were a tuna product and Nope, just the tuna product um, that we were not able to verify. So those are two fairly concrete pieces. The other one is the spend question, spend versus reduction. So like in animal welfare, we can look at um, moving a portion of your spend to um, a high environmental sustainability product. So in produce, USDA organic would be a very likely one. USDA organic is level three, so we'd be looking for 5% of your spend to go towards organic products, for example. So if we had antibiotics, which you do, if we had seafood, which you're close, there's the tuna to be resolved, and then 5% of the spend going to organic product, we, we would have achieved baseline in environmental sustainability. Some districts are choosing to rather than go with a spend strategy, look at a reduction strategy. And that often comes because um, it might be synergistic with other climate friendly menuing initiatives that a district might have in place, um, might fit with sort of the, the values and the desires of the community. And in some cases, it might be more cost effective to be looking at um, plant proteins to replace um, or rather than looking at an organic certified product, for example, that may come at a, at a cost premium. Does that start to answer the question without getting too deep into the weeds? I think so. Um, and then I, yeah, I think so. What do you think, RJ? Is he gonna stay on mute? Yep, there we go. I have to. I'm a. I'm a meter. I'm like, okay, where is it? When there's my picture up there. Why can't I make them go? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, so it's, it's um, antibiotics and organics make yes. environmentally. Yeah. Antibiotics, well. seafood, organic isn't the only one. It's just the most wide, widely available organic or, or environment. 
Of the certifications we're looking at in environmental sustainability, USDA Organic is the highest performing and the most widely available. Um, we also have a, a an indicator at level one where if your uh, distributor, particularly in produce, can work with the farmers to get an affidavit about pesticide usage, that's an opportunity to be rec those items to be recognized at level one. And at level one, we'd be looking for 15% of the spend to qualify at level one. So there's a little bit of a, you know, a slightly different pathway. It's still a spend strategy. It's just a different, um, a different indicator in terms of environmental sustainability that we would look for. You're basically looking at chemicals. You're not, you're not necessarily looking at, at the farming method or anything, right? Like no-till or, or maybe using hydroponics or something. Yeah. Or basically, vegetables, you know, antibiotics or chemicals. Yeah. Um, it I, looks I like it's more that part. Yeah, I would say so we're going through the process of updating our standards so they'll we'll have a new version in 2022 and between uh, you know when these standards were published the conversation around agroecological production has definitely taken off and gotten much, much more robust. So in that standards update, we do a pretty comprehensive review and stakeholder engagement literature review with subject matter experts to identify all the various certifications and indicators we might be able to recognize in the standards. Um, so chemicals or no chemicals, I hear you loud and clear, it's pretty reductive and there's so much subtlety in agricultural production, particularly with regards to climate and environmental sustainability. So that's definitely a piece that needs to be reviewed over time or, or regularly so that we make sure that we are evolving along with the science as it's emerging. And isn't something to, to consider um, swapping um, meat-based products for plant-based proteins? I know that's something that our district was, before COVID happened, um, like a black bean burger instead of, and just, um, and even just, we're not even like getting rid of the beef burger, but just offering the plant-based and seeing if mm -hmm. more students are, are selecting that. And then over time, if that's like shifting our, um, our meat consumption, isn't that like a strategy too? Okay. Exactly, yeah. And if we're, if we're able to get complete data, again, it's for, we're data nerds at the center. So if we're able to get complete data on your purchase, we can calculate a carbon and water footprint for your purchasing. And then we can look at how that carbon and water footprint decreases over time based on these choices. So that's the tool that we would use to measure the reduction strategy in environmental sustainability. So yeah, absolutely looking at those plant-based alternatives and also offering more vegetarian items to um, look at those trends over time relative to environmental impact is, is definitely something that we're talking about. I'm gonna um, just keep going, but I appreciate being interrupted and y'all are asking great questions, so, so don't be shy, but I wanna make sure we get to Keep digging in. I was on the wrong monitor back here in Rhode Island. Okay. Um, so just, uh, I thought it might be interesting to go to a slightly deeper uh, level of information with regards to the, the categories where we see a really high performance, just to give you all a little more context about what we're seeing. Um, so breaking down that um, almost 14% of your spend in local economies, um, you know, what, what kinds of products are showing up when we're looking at um, local products? And for reference, in local economies, we're looking at a, a, a mileage range of about 250 miles from your location. And we also look at ownership status. So for a, a company or a business to qualify in local economies, they also need to be locally owned and operated. And that's, that's because we wanna see that local economic impact maximized. And so that's another way we're verifying that value. So here, um, milk and dairy is the, the highest sort of performing food category in local economies followed by grains. So that's going to show up in your bakery, cereal items, uh, some of your snacks, uh, and followed by produce, and then meat. Um, so I would just reiterate here that, um, you know, it's, it's our assumption in a baseline assessment that 
we don't yet have complete data. So this might not be 100% accurate, but this is of the data that we were able to get from all of your vendors. This is where we see a performance. And I say that as a little bit of a caveat because it's sort of surprising that produce is on the low side right here where you're in a very, very high producing um, county and part of the country where produce is being produced on the regular. It's also produce supply chains can be hard to get that point of production data. Um, so as vendors get to understand our program, we tend to see improvement in quality over time. And also as school districts build in data transparency into their solicitations and their contracts, we also see an improvement in data quality over time. So it's just always important to make that caveat when we're digging into this. And particularly if you see something that's surprising, it's likely a data explanation, not a purchasing explanation for these kinds of questions. I have the same analysis for uh, valued workforce here, um, where again, we see meat and milk and dairy being the strongest performances. And this actually, um, we tend to see again, because union contract is what we're looking at most often, union contracts tend to be more present at the point of manufacturing than the point of production. While there are plenty of unionized farms out there and businesses, um, they're more common the larger the business is. So this is a little bit at the other end of the spectrum from local economies. So that we see it in milk and dairy and meat and meat processing um, is, is not a surprise. That's in keeping with what we're seeing with other districts and institutions. And I think um, coming out of the year we've had and the, the press around uh, labor conditions in, in meat processing, um, we really see that it's, it's a pretty important story to tell um, and exciting to hear to see here that already in your supply chain, um, you know, 42 percent of the meat that you're purchasing was from unionized uh, manufacturing plants. OK, so then there's there's a fun piece that we get to talk about here, which is extra points. Um, so these are opportunities for us to call out really high bar practices that institutions are um, are doing in their purchasing programs. Um, and so every value category has extra points where we can really celebrate where um, schools and institutions are going above and beyond. Um, so you all have extra points for sourcing more than 1% of your local products from a small minority owned farm. Um, and we are, our data team is, is working hard on looking at equity metrics within the local economies category. So that's a place we expect to see more robust and disaggregated data so we can offer insight into how those dollars are impacting um, your community from an equity perspective. Uh, we also have an opportunity in the nutrition category to celebrate the partnership that you have with Food Corps and the harvest of the month to promote um, the fruits and veggies in your menu and in the, in the curriculum. Um, and also that there are culturally appropriate menu items so that everybody is feeling a sense of belonging when they're eating in your cafeteria and finding foods that resonate with them. Um, and then Lean and Green Fridays uh, is extra points in the environmental sustainability category for the reasons that Anna, that you called out and, and being able to influence the carbon and water footprint of your purchases. So we see a lot of reason uh, to celebrate what's going on here and a lot of work um, that I'm sure you all are, are building on. Okay, so sort of circling back to, and I'm, I'm at the end of the presentation, but circling back to um, our mission statement and, and the theory of change that we bring to this work. Um, so, you know, analyzing every single line item of a school's food spend is a huge piece of our work and working partnering institution to institution is sort of how we operationalize that vision. Um, but then if you zoom up into the big picture and think about what this change can look like as we start to build demand, um, I just want to walk you through our theory of change here, where just like we're doing here, we're working with individual institutions, and they might be schools, it might be a corrections facility or a social service agency, to increase the amount of good food that you're buying. Um, 
but then we're getting institutions together that share those values. So right now we have 54 institutions enrolled in the program in 22 cities across the country that represent more than a billion dollars in food spend. So here we're starting to build a movement, a movement that we believe is strong enough to change the food system. And those institutions are working in partnership with grassroots coalitions in the cities and counties where they're working um, to make sure that folks from the labor community and the animal welfare community and the health and nutrition community have the opportunity to support uh, you all in implementing this work. So that's where we're building a movement. And by building a movement and aggregating those millions of dollars of food spend together, we send signals to the market, just like Anna was describing, we want more organic products, we want more high welfare products, we want more nutritious products in our schools and institutions and in our communities. And then that cycle of sort of meaningful change and impact inspires more institutions to adopt and join that program. So we're talking right now about what would it look like for every major city across the country to be enrolled in the Good Food Purchasing Program? What would that mean for their communities? What would that mean for our ability to change the way the market is bringing food to institutions and to communities through public purchasing? Um, so that's really the big picture that, you know, all the way from a single item of food to the work that you all are doing inside your district, to the collaborative work that's happening in Ventura Farm to School, as a part of the Good Food Purchasing Program across the country, um, it's a really exciting moment to be thinking and talking about this work. And I think the pandemic um, for all of us has only reinforced and brought to light more the importance of this work and doing it in partnership with folks like you all. So that's that's the, the program in Thank your you. neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's so just it's so I think this project is just so interesting and I was so excited to be part of it. And um, we're definitely going to share the video with lots of students and lots of teachers and classes even now and next year, um, just so that we can really make our students aware that our community is um, committed to doing such great work. And um, you've helped us do that. So thank you. Um, I don't know. Does anyone have any questions? RJ wanted to know about the wheat. So how do we have local bread? Because we don't see any like wheat being grown anywhere near here. So what does that look like? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we look at three points in the supply chain and then we weight the spend accordingly. So we look at, in the case of wheat, it would be the farm, the manufacturer, so the, the bakery or the processing and then distribution. Um, so in those grain products, very likely it's local manufacturing and local distribution. Um, but may well be produced elsewhere in the United States. And so we give 33% of each of those dollars for what we're able to verify at those three points in the supply chain. Yeah, that, that makes a little more sense. Good. I'm like, I haven't seen any wheat fields anywhere around here. Right. Yeah, exactly. You guys are probably swimming in produce and, you know, some of us might not even know what wheat looks like in the field. And yet um, there's a lot of good local production work going on to bring that bread to market. But Laura, yeah. did, you, did you say you're in Rhode Island? I live in Rhode Island, that's correct. That's where I grew up. But oh, neat. Um, this one, in the chat, I mean, I, I know Jersey is like famous for their truck farms, um, but you know, Rhode Island's got some too in South County or wherever, um, where they based in the summertime, they're growing everything, right? So mm -hmm. maybe that's what you're thinking is happening here. I mean, our, we've got lots of stuff growing, but it's kind of like monoculture, yes. depending on the time of year. Right? I yeah. mean, honestly, you know, like, no, nah, Henshi doesn't know what he's talking about. But, but now, if you drive by into the fields, you'll see, you know, huge, gigantic fields of like great stocks during high school. Right now, I think it's um, artich, no, what is it? Uh, Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like, like miles. Well, it probably, probably is a mile. Yeah. Um, I mean, just huge, right? But that's kind of what we do here. So I can see why, you know, our actually you know a strong point there because there's only so many brussels sprouts you can eat right and then and we'll have to wait months and there'll, there'll be strawberries there and then months later it'll be celery or something yeah and lemons lots of lemons probably but uh but yeah so i think yeah it's not it's not the same as like mm -hmm. east coast where you know, that the summer it's like planting everything and then bring it to the farmer's market or whatever mm -hmm. that's great a little, a little bit different 
Something that's really exciting that has happened because of this. So like I said, how the districts are committed to in our county are committed to increasing their local produce. Like she showed on the chart a few um, slides ago that that was, you know, even though we're growing so much food right here in our county, not a lot of it is ending up in our cafeterias. And so um, the, the nutrition services directors um, just last Friday had this meeting where we are working on like a collaborative bid process to increase our local purchasing. So um, I don't even know if we told you about that. <laughs> or no, I'm so excited to hear that because I know that was, yeah. that was an idea that you all had. And yeah, so it's, 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 I mean, they've been working on it all year. And um, the farms that we already buy from are interested in growing what the schools need. So they're even shifting, okay, well, if you guys are going to be buying, you know, these items in these months, we're going to grow that amount for you, which is really incredible too. And so, um, I mean, you know, what I've learned about this process is that it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so, I mean, just the change is incremental and takes time and we do it like piece by piece as we can. Um, but it's been just such a, it's a really, really like interesting um, process to be part of. And um, yeah, I think painting that big picture of, you know, collectively, if every city, like you said, if every city or school district in the country was doing this, I mean, what would, what would that look like, right? Like what kind of an impact would that have? So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Very exciting. Well, yeah. I look forward to hearing more about the, the process and then the, um, the, the product of that collective uh, solicitation. I'm really excited to, to follow yes. that. Um, yeah. Yes. Any other questions, guys? I can share her contact information. And um, that was awesome. Thanks for sharing. It was nice oh, to yeah. get like the details. <laughs> Absolutely. My pleasure. And, you know, we always want to make sure to like, the conversation shouldn't end when we hand off the assessment and write an action plan or whatever it is, but make sure that we're able to support you all in telling the story of the good work that you're doing and how these values are showing up in your work. So this feels like a good opportunity to make sure that the students are aware of, of what you're working on. Definitely. I mean, that's, all of our kids are coming or all those kids come to our school district. So they'll, okay. they'll love to hear about this. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Well, thanks for inviting me, Anna. And, um, you know, I look forward to staying in touch and absolutely if folks have questions about the program or, or what was in those slides, I'm, I'm happy to unpack that. Okay. Thank right. you, everybody. Be well. Nice to meet you. Take care. Bye-bye.